the uh, reference oscillators turned up in the post this morning um, and uh, getting ready to install it. This is the oven air oscillator. The, uh, I think the later ones were Hewlett Packard or vice versa. But basically it's a 10 megahertz uh, ovenized oscillator. There's the connections on the bottom. It mounts into three rubber um, sort of isolators, the one at uh, the bottom or the top of the unit and these two here. Uh, obviously this is the RF output and we've got various supplies for um, the uh, heater, the uh, supply for the oscillator output and ground connections and things like that. So a pretty straightforward device. We've got uh, connections, uh, screws here, these, you undo these screws and behind there there's some um, trimming capacitors or yeah I think they're capacitors, I don't think they're uh, resistors and we'll use that to uh, trim up the oscillator and to get it to uh, as accurate as we can. Now this will normally need probably I don't know maybe an hour at least to warm up and ideally we want to be uh, adjusting it in its uh, final resting position which will be like that in the, in the unit. Uh, what I'll do, what I plan to do is uh, get it into the unit power it up, warm it up. Um, it should be in the ballpark figure anyway uh, but uh, get it warmed up and then we'll wire up my uh, rubidium to the, uh, os uh, the oscilloscope and uh, monitor the output of this from the back panel which I think you can do uh, and then what we'll do is we'll just sync the two waveforms together so they don't move apart or together basically synchronize them. That's probably that most accurate way of doing it. It's probably more accurate than a uh, um, a, a frequency counter, mainly because that uh, the frequency counter will probably only resolve to a sort of 0.1 of a hertz, which is more than enough. But uh, if you've got a visual representation of the phase shift, you get a much better idea of how close you are to being exactly the same frequency. Now it's going to change with time, and it's though it's it's fairly critical within a hertz. I should think be absolutely fine. So let's um, get the bottom off the uh, Specky analyzer and have a look. Okay, so what I've got to do is I've got to get it into there. Um, there's our RF lead, and you see the black connector at the bottom, which is uh, to connect up the supply to the uh, oscillator. So um, I think the easiest thing to do, looking at it, is probably slide this back cover off. Sometimes you just force this out and bend it back, which is a bit of a stupid way of doing it, but um, obviously just they just whipped it out when they needed it quickly. The sort of thing I would probably do if I thought they wasn't going to be using the other bit of equipment. So let's, uh, let's get the covers off and see if we can uh, see how this comes apart. I think the best thing for me to do, if I zoom out, let's see what I'm doing, is remove the top bracket that holds the uh, RF, uh, the IF section to the uh, to this part. And then this part should just basically, I would have thought, slide off once I've taken the handles off. I have had this off before and it was, uh, it was quite stiff, it didn't slide very easily. Okay, so that's that cover off there. So now we've got access down through here, uh, which is uh, easier. So yeah, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove these screws here and pop the oven in. So let's turn it over so it makes it a bit easier for you to see. Okay, so I can get uh, not an ideal camera angle, I know. So what I'm basically doing is removing that bottom clamp that holds the uh, oscillator in. See, someone's bloody mangled it. So I might have to bend that straight in the vise. So it's quite soft, so I can bend that fairly straight myself. So off of the oscillator up inside. I aren't worried particularly at the moment of a connector or anything, because I'll do that in a minute. That should just fit into the hole. That 
actually what I will do I think is I will connect the RF connector in because that's going to be a bit tricky to get to. So connecting the RF connector in. And what I'm doing now is just locating those two pins into the rubber grommet. so they don't get trapped and then the back of the connector right this is the uh, bracket that was all mangled okay that's holding it tightly Okay, so that's the oscillator mounted. Let's have a closer look. Okay, that's the oscillator in. Um, I had to turn it round, actually had it 180 degrees round and then I couldn't get to the access to the uh, adjustment screws. The adjustment screws are behind that behind that plate. That cutout was in the wrong place, so don't start torches messing around. I've got the connector plugged in there. Okay, so we're ready to uh, power this up and see if it oscillates. Now we'll, we'll know pretty quickly by all the red lights should go out and uh, to prove it's got a lock. So we've got these outer lock lights in various places that will come on if it's uh, unlocked. Um, rubidium's warming up. Um, so I think the thing to do now is to, I'll need to power it on and I just need to, I'm sorry this is handheld, um, set the reference to internal with just a flick of a screwdriver. So that's that switch there. So we're on the internal reference now. In theory, if we power this up, now it may be out of lock initially if the oven's cold. Well, of course, the oven isn't bloody working. There's absolutely no guarantee this stuff works when you buy it second hand. Uh, but let's switch it on, and our first sign will be there's no, no lock, these red lights will be on. And they're off, so that's a good sign. Shows that the uh, reference is probably working. Um, so what I need to do now, as I say, is let it warm up for a while. Uh, we'll get the scope wired up, uh, and then we'll basically take our uh, reference from the back of the unit, and we'll um, see how this oscillator settles down. The rubidium should come into lock any second now. It's been on for a while. Once that's in lock, we can. Uh, Start having a look to see what it's like. Okay, for you fan of uh, Doctor Who special effects, uh, we're using J mode. Um, and it's not particularly good on a, uh, a digital scope like this, uh, but I can't be bothered to dig out the analog scope. Basically, we look at the phase difference between the two oscillators, and you can see there it's all over the place. Um, so the, the oscillator at the moment is nowhere near 10 megahertz. So what I'm doing is I'm feeding the uh, rubidium into channel one and using that to trigger on and channel 2 is the output of the uh, spectrum analyzer's uh, reference oscillator. So we're looking for basically um, a stable circle or a stable line, a very slow moving or stationary um, trace on the waveform. It doesn't matter if it's circle, it doesn't matter if it's out of phase or in phase, as long as it's see that something like that. Now if I run it through that's how it was normally. You know, it's a bit noisy this way from these scopes are a bit noisy. We could put a bit of averaging on here, I suppose, but um, you can see that it's a bit... Let's put some averaging on. There you go. Yeah, averaging doesn't actually really help a lot. But you can see it's moving in and out of phase all the time. Uh, so we need to let that... Let this oven, let oven oscillator warm up properly, but it's a good sort of... 10 hertz out of out of out of sync at the moment so let's give this a little while 
and uh, I'll come back and have a twiddle once it's uh, nearer, nearer a warm nut period. Okay, it's been about 10 minutes now. Um, you can see that it's it's getting closer. Um, it's drifting in and out of lock, or not in lock, drift, sorry, drifting in and out of phase, uh, which is suggesting that the oven is still warming up. Uh, as you can see here, I've removed the screw to get access to the course control. Uh, I'm just going to give it a little tweak uh, once I've found the right tool to, to just bring it a bit closer in line. So we've got, I think we've got the the screw head now, so giving a tweak. Anyway. There we go. So I'll leave that for the minute. Uh, we're pretty closely in sync now. Let's go XY mode again for all those Doctor Who fans. There we go, got a nice rotating circle that you'd expect to see in a, a mad scientist laboratory uh, on the 70s Doctor Who series okay so we and it's quite a good representation this actually because you can see how quickly it is it gives you how many t one revolution per second is obviously one hertz so you can see that uh, we're within really within about one hertz now I should think uh, but we'll let it settle down give it a bit more time uh, I'll leave the camera in this position and I'll, I'll come back it's now OK, I'll come back in five minutes and we'll see how it's stabilised. OK, it's just over, about seven minutes since the last clip. Um, you can see it's, uh, it's actually stabilised now, but it's uh, obviously moving too fast. It's about a hertz, one hertz fast or slow, I don't know which one it is. So let's just bring that in and then we can put this back together again. So we want for stationary up, stationary circle really, or stationary um, trace on the scoop. Been too far the other way. This is the course adjustment I'm doing now, so this is a bit jumpy now. That's pretty good actually. That's pretty stationary. So that's the sort of thing we're looking for. Uh, I'm going to leave it running for another half an hour. Uh, and then I'm going to adjust the fine adjustment if it needs any, but I think that's uh, I think that's pretty pretty good. Okay, just in case you're interested, it's about quarter an hour. Twenty minutes has been on now. This is the uh, the waveform we're getting. I'll just switch back to um, come out of Lisa J mode, and then you'll see the, um, the two traces interacting with each other. So the moving trace now is the um, spectrum analyzer and the one on the bottom which turns down so it's a bit easier to see. So this one here is the rubidium and the top one is the spectrum analyzer and there's, they're absolutely more or less perfect. I think if you watch it and you sped it up you probably see a slight shift within a couple of minutes but I think that's uh, as good as you're going to get it on a, an oscillator like that. I'm very happy with that, it's very stable. So. I think the next stage is to put this back together, put the base on it uh, and then plug it into the uh, video display and see how well it performs. Alright, that's it, up and running. Um, just running through a couple of calibration processes that you do on these. Um, see that it's got a nice stable waveform, measuring correctly, the sweep seems to be working correctly. Uh, just going to recall some of the uh, um, calibration points. This is our uh, 20, 20 uh, minus 10 dB, is it? Yes, min minus 10 dBm reference. It's at minus 8.7 at the moment. That's just an adjustment on the front panel down here. Bring this up to the right point. You've probably seen me do this before. Uh, minus 10 is just there. And then recall, I think it's recall 9, is it? Nope. Wrong button. Recall 9. Okay. Now what this does is you adjust this control at the top here, which is frequency 0, uh, and that give, you adjust that for the maximum level on the waveform. So I'm going to adjust that. That just brings this line up. So it's just peaking the sensitivity of the, uh, from what I understand, the, a, the IF section. So. 
as high as possible, and that is as high as possible because that was I adjusted that before I swapped the uh, RF section over. So it looks work. It's absolutely fine. It's just doing this for a reset. No error messages. Uh, now what you can do is run a calibration process on it. Now, unfortunately, this RF section didn't come with the slide-out cover, uh, so it obviously it was installed on the other model, uh, and I'm going to I want to keep that with that. So. I have found someone on the internet who actually had scanned the whole sheet in, so I'm just going to print that out uh, and have it as like hanging on the side of the unit, you know, like laminator A4 sheet, so I can see what the uh, calibration process is. But uh, it's one of the recall options again, or a second function. But um, it's working fine, very pleased. Uh, it's cost me a bit more money than I hoped. Obviously, I bought two new processor boards that I didn't need uh, due to my real probably lack of sort of working through properly uh, but all it really boiled down to is it needed that uh, that chip that inserted which was actually in a, in a, a RAM chip uh, when I looked the number up it was quite hard to find the information on it but that's a RAM chip so it's needed a new RAM chip and the oven controlled oscillator uh, and as you can see it's working fine and it's good because I've got a backup unit should something go wrong with this one in the future uh, the lower section of course um, I can replace it so what I'm going to do now is try and look out for spares for the top end now if you remember a couple of years ago someone gave me some video boards for this top video thing now the display on this is really strong as you can see I'll give you a quick blast of how bright it is it's really strong CRT and that's mainly thanks to a chap who uh, used to look after it in our lab who's very sort of uh, very precious over equipment like this well, it's actually so precious that um, um, if if you want anything borrowed, if you want to borrow anything from him, it's like you have to go there begging. It's like uh, trying to get blood out of a stone. But he also is very careful with looking after gear, and that's hence why this section, this whole thing, has been in such good condition because um, he always had the screen turned right the way down. Um, it was, and it wasn't running day in day out like some of this gear is it you know it was only ran for probably a couple of days at a time and then it was turned off so as I say the CRT is in really good good state uh, uh, so that's uh, it's got a good few years of life hopefully in it uh, as long as nothing else goes wrong the capacitors all been uh, checked and uh, all seem fine uh, I'm not into changing capacitors just for the hell of it. Uh, a lot, the capacitors that are used in these Hewlett Packard machines are all very high quality capacitors. They're no rubbish in there. Uh, I'd just be replacing them with, um, you know, maybe slightly higher temperature rating capacitors. But a lot of the problems is with the capacitors on here, let's, particularly in the power supply, they're all screw mounted. Um, and some of those capacitors haul shields on their other ends so they're basically the other end of the capacitor has got a, like a, a plastic insert in it that holds a guard that protects some other part of the of the, of the unit uh, and replacement with modern capacitors of different sizes makes it all all that you can't you can't fit the guards anymore so what I'm saying is these these caps are fine um, they've been checked for ESR and leakage they're, they're good uh, uh, a lot of them are wet tants in here as well and they're not those bead type ones that you see go up in little firecrackers these are the wet tantalums that um, are self-healing to a degree so if they get a fault they'll, they can sort of recover themselves uh, uh, and the few the very few electrolytics that HP use are as I say very good quality uh, and it's all been cleaned out all the all the edge contacts have been cleaned um, all the dust has been blown out of it it's basically had a full service really um, yeah so um, quite chuffed with that as you can probably tell uh, thanks for watching and uh, more to come